speaker this morning is Alexander Guy Poonin from the Stetzloff Institute. He's going to tell us about the Bellows conjecture in odd dimensional global checks and spaces. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to this conference. And it's my great pleasure to be here with the uh, Actually, uh, still, I do not know what is the relation of this to quantum topology, but maybe some. Okay, uh, what is, uh, I start with the notion of a flexible polyhedron. It's basic. <coughs> oh, my talk will be on this object. What is a flexible polyhedron? Uh, assume that we, ha we have a usual polyhedron, uh, more precisely a polyhedral surface in three-dimensional space, so I consider the boundary of the polyhedron. And this boundary is made of rigid wooden plates and hinges uh, at edges. So this thing is allowed to flex. But still, if we consider, for instance, tetrahedron with rigid plates and hinges at edges, we still cannot flex it. Uh, though it is allowed, there are no possibilities to flex. And uh, moreover, uh, by famous theory of, by Cauchy of the beginning of the 19th century, no convex polyhedron is uh, flexible. So convex implies a rigid. Uh, I always walk, uh, I started with dimension 3, but I can work in arbitrary dimension greater or equal to 3. So we can consider the same object in dimension n greater than or equal to 3. Uh, then in, the, in arbitrary dimension, uh, we have n minus 1 dimensional polyhedral surface. And we have rigid n minus one dimensional faces and hinges at n minus two dimensional faces. So rigid n minus one faces and hinges at n minus two faces. And the same picture. If it is convex, it is always a rigid. Uh, so, however. Uh, there is there are examples of non-convex and flexible polyhedron. Uh, these examples are not easy, and uh, the history uh, uh, is rather long. It started in 19, uh, in 1897 by uh, a wonderful work by Bricard, who uh, considered the problem his he studied flexible octahedra. This means uh, flexible polyhedra with combinatoric structure of an octahedra. And he found three types of this flexible octahedra. So flexible octahedron has six vertices. And uh, anybody knows uh, this combinatorial structure. But for sure, all these flexible octahedra are not convex, because convex are unfinite theory. Moreover, he found three types. Three types means three continuous family of flexible octahedra. And moreover, he proved that none of them is not only convex, none of them is embedded. All these surfaces are self intersecting So, all self intersect intersection. So, uh, starting from this work, it appears uh, the understanding that we uh, we can define uh, a flexible polyhedron as an embedded polyhedral surface, but it is not obligatory. Uh, there are also, uh, there are many examples which are not embedded, but still interesting. Uh, I will, uh, to be more concrete, I will describe two types of this two of the, of the three types of this octahedron. 
uh, first of all, we can consider, okay, if we have an octahedron, we have these uh, vertices, A1, B1, our opposite vertices, A2, B2, and A3, B3. And now, uh, this in standard octahedron, and now uh, this situation with arbitrary flexible octahedron. Consider an arbitrary line, and consider three segments such that they are orthogonal to this line and they are divided by this line each of them is divided by this line on two different or on two equal parts so consider such n and let these vertices be a1 b1 a2 b2 and a3 b3 uh, if we so these three red segments are diagonals of octahedron. Uh, to uh, I can draw all edges, so all pairs of vertices which are not connected by segments in my picture are connected by edges. But if I draw all edges, it w w w will be impossible to understand anything. So imagine that all pairs of vertices except for these three pairs are joined by an edges and we also have faces, and this guy is always self-intercepted. But it is flexible. It is easy to see that it is flexible. Uh, actually, to describe this picture, we have sem seven parameters. Seven parameters. It's easy to see. We have three lengths, we have two distances, and we have two angles. Uh, uh, the angle of rotation of this with respect to this and the angle of rotation of that with respect to this. So seven parameters. Uh, and how many edge lengths do we have? Actually, an octahedron has 12 edges, but here we have a symmetry. So we have only six different edge lengths. So from seven parameters we have six edge lengths. And this means that for a generic set of edge lengths, we have a one-dimensional <coughs> plane of uh, uh, octahedra with this edge length. This is the first type of Burkhardt's octahedra. Oh, may maybe I stop. Uh, 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 with describing different types, uh, it's enough to understand the main idea. And uh, uh, there are also two other types of uh, Burkhardt's octahedra. Okay, and it took to 80 years, there was a, a mm, very long-standing uh, problem which was called the rigidity problem and the conjecture was uh, often conjecture, it was conjectured that uh, flexible polyhedron cannot be embedded. And only in 1977 Connolly uh, found the first example the first example of, of an embedded flexible polyhedron. And then uh, other examples follow. Uh, okay, but I'm interested not only in uh, flexible polyhedra uh, in uh, um, our <coughs> usual free space, but also in other spaces. So, which uh, I, we can ask of uh, flexible polyhedra in arbitrary Euclidean space, uh, Lobachevsky space, and spherical space, so all spaces of uh, positive curvature uh, of uh, dimension greater than or equal to 3. In dimension 2, it is not interesting. All polygons with at least four sides are flexible. And, uh, there are many interesting questions about configuration spaces of, in, of them, but this is another story. I do not want to touch it. So I always uh, assume that n equal greater than equal to 3. All these examples are in dimension 3. Actually, one, not the first type, but the second type of Bricard's octahedra can be generalized to dimension 4. So in dimension 4, self-intersected examples were also known. And indeed, all these examples can be uh, transmitted to Lobachevsky and spherical spaces. For instance, the same, quite the same reasoning works in all these spaces. 
So there are there were examples in all these spaces for n equals three and four. Uh, well, actually, in dimension uh, and for a long time there were no other examples, uh, and this is my result uh, of uh, 2013 that there are examples of self-intersecting. Flexible polyhedra in all uh, these spaces of all dimensions greater than or equal to three. So in dimensions five and five, this is new. Uh, but this is not the result which I'm going to speak. Uh, now I just uh, uh, want to start with some history of the problem. Uh, and that the second natural question is whether there are embedded examples. Again, in dimension three, in all spaces, there are embedded examples. Uh, this, uh, this example and some uh, further simple examples uh, can be generalized. But in dimensions four and higher, it is still open problem. Uh, so open problem. Do there exist embedded flexible polyhedra in Euclidean space or Lobachevsky space of dimensions greater than or equal to 4? But in the third case, the situation is uh, quite uh, is easier here. Uh, first of all, in spherical situation, there are stupid examples of flexible polyhedra. Uh, okay, consider, for instance, let it be three-dimensional sphere, and we have this diameter, which is two-dimensional sphere. Inside two-dimensional sphere, we can consider a flexible polygon. There are many, many flexible polygons, almost all polygons. So we have here flexible polygon, and now we take the suspension over this flexible polygon with vertices at poles of the sphere. And we obtain a flexible polyhedron. And there are plenty, plenty of them of such type. So uh, to, to obtain, uh, this is not interesting, this appears because we have two uh, uh, antipodal points. And to obtain a reasonable situation. It is interesting to ask about uh, flexible polyhedra in an open uh, three-dimensional, or not in uh, uh, three-dimensional, in an open hemisphere. So to forbid uh, to have these antipodal points. So uh, a reasonable question in this an open set hemisphere. Not, not a sphere. And then uh, it's again my result of, uh, of this year that in SSN was arbitrary n, there exists uh, embedded flexible polyhedra. Uh, in, in open hemisphere, there exists an embedded flexible polyhedra. So the situation is easier than in the Euclidean and in the Lobachev's case. Okay, but, okay, let, let me pass to the may, most intriguing problem, uh, maybe most, one of the most intriguing problems concerning uh, uh, flexible polyhedra. This is called Below's conjecture. It was proposed by most probably it was proposed by Robert Connolly. It, it is not quite clear, but seems to be so. Uh, very soon after his example of embedded flexible polyhedra. So when examples of embedded flexible polyhedra started to appear, uh, it was noticed that the volume of any of these examples remained constant during the flexion. And the Below's conjecture is that this is true for any flexible polyhedra. So the volume 
of any <coughs> flexible polyhedron is constant during the flexion. Embedded or non-embedded? Uh, it is uh, not uh, not only embedded. Actually, for non-embedded polyhedron, we can all also uh, define a, a very natural concept of algebraic volume. Oh, for, for instance, I, I just draw it for polygon. Okay, if we have polygon like this, we should compute each point as many times uh, uh, as is the winding number uh, around this point. So this is with uh, uh, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and this region is computed twice. And, and the same uh, works in arbitrary dimension. So for, for arbitrary, not necessarily embedded pol pol polyhedron, we can uh, we can define volume, and the conjecture is that this volume is constant during the flash. Uh, well, and this was the conjecture, and uh, the wonderful result by Idat Savitov uh, of 1996 was the proof of this conjecture. Originally, this conjecture was in three-dimensional Euclidean space, so he proved that uh, Belov's conjecture holds in three-dimensional Euclidean space, for all the hydra in three-dimensional Euclidean space. And at, uh, sure, there is a natural question whether it is true in other spaces. We have all these spaces. Question, could you just briefly say what you mean by the volume? I didn't say one dimension higher. Ah, oh, this is in two dimensions. Yes, yes. So if I have a, a two a two dimensional polyhedron in three spaces. Ah, no, no, no. Uh, the volume not of a surface. Yeah. Uh, the volume bounded by the surface. <coughs> we 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 take. Uh, oh, oh. So you assume you have a map of a three dimensional polyhedron in two. In two for for three instance, three. we have a two dimensional polyhedral surface, yeah. and we count the volume bounded by it. Yeah. And uh, we take each region with uh, with multiplicity, which is equal to the uh, number uh, to the uh, linear number around. So uh, this is example of a polygon in the plane. We, it is not interesting to consider the volume of a surface because uh, it is for sure a constant because the uh, surface doesn't change. The uh, but the volume of uh, bounded by this surface. The region bounded by the surface uh, changes, but, but still the volume is uh, preserved. Uh, okay, and uh, it is my result again of 2012 that this below conjecture holds in all Euclidean spaces. Holds in <coughs> Euclidean spaces of all dimensions. Okay, my, my result is for greater than or equal to 4. Uh, uh, okay, and what what is, uh, again, I do, I do not want to speak on this to, today. I want to pass to non-Euclidean spaces. So what is the situation in spherical and Lobachevsky cases? And it appears that the situation is quite different. I start with spheres. Uh, again, uh, uh, we should ask about uh, we should ask about open hemispheres. Otherwise, it, it is not true for uh, very easy reasons. Uh, okay, and it appeared it is a result of Alexander of 1997 that Below's conjecture is wrong. in three-dimensional open chemistry. So he constructed a self-intersected intersecting uh, example of a polyhedron <coughs> of the reflex of the polyhedron in three-dimensional open hemisphere, uh, which uh, has uh, non-constant volume. Uh, and uh, again, my result uh, of this year is that below conjecture is wrong in all 
hemispheres. Uh, and moreover, there are uh, embedded. Sasha, we, what did the first name of Alexander people are? Well, Victor Alexander for, for, for most of this. So the, moreover, there are embedded counterexamples. Uh, actually, uh, uh, on this blackboard, I mentioned one result twice. The matter is, okay, th that on the on the top and on the bot bottom of this uh, blackboard, uh, it's the same result because uh, <coughs> that uh, embedded flexible polyhedron uh, uh, it has non-constant volume. Uh, actually, maybe uh, it is interesting that this embedded flexible polyhedron uh, has very nice properties. Uh, Assume that this is a n-dimensional sphere. So in its initial position, uh, this polyhedron, polyhedron is n minus one dimensional uh, uh, surface in this sphere. In its initial position, it is this equa equator, equatorial uh, hemisphere with some hinges. So all, all uh, the hedral angles are straight. It, it is flat in this position. Then it starts to uh, flex and it, at every moment t greater than zero it becomes to be in upper hemisphere. Then it flexes, flexes, flexes and then it returns to the this flat position but it is not embedded anymore. It returns folded in some way. Then it started to flex in in the uh, below in this below this equator, and again it becomes it returns to the initial position. So so in this initial position, its volume volume bounded by is the volume of a hemisphere, and in any time greater than zero, the volume is smaller. So so, so it's not constant. Uh, okay, but today I want to, so in spheres below conjecture is not true. Uh, and today I want uh, to, I will later maybe uh, formulate one conjecture which may still be true in sphere, but not now. Okay, today I want to speak of the following theorem, uh, which is again my result. Uh, and uh, the theorem, I theorem is that below is conjecture is true uh, in odd-dimensional Lobachevsky spaces where n greater than 3 uh, and n odd. But uh, I know, I can prove only that it is true for bounded flexible polyhedron. The matter is in Lobachevsky space, uh, we, uh, alongside with bounded polyhedron, we can consider polyhedron with, um, mm, with vertices on the absolute and they still have finite volume, uh, so we can ask whether it is true for such polyhedron, I don't know. The, the, I, I can prove it only for Polyhedra which are bound. Uh, and again, uh, this restriction that n is odd, it appears from the proof. I cannot adopt my proof for even n, but still there are no counterexamples. So the even case is completely open. Uh, moreover, all examples which were computed show that the volume is constant in even dimensions uh, as well. But uh, uh, well, so not, 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 nothing is known for any. Actually, this is a surprising result because we have in sphere it is not true, and the general intuition is that uh, okay, sphere and Lobachevsky spaces that they should be analytic continuations of each other or something like that. Um, so, so, so some properties of volume so should be. Uh, it, it is well known that if we consider a volume of a tetrahedron, for instance, as a function of its tetrahedral angles, then uh, this volume in Lobachevsky spaces and in 
the sphere they can be obtained from each other by certain uh, good uh, analytic continuation. So it seems that it should be not true also, but it appears that it is true. And I will uh, try to. Um, uh, uh, I will not give uh, the proof now for of course because it's long. But I will try to explain what's the difference between odd dimensional Lobachevsky spaces and uh, spheres and even dimensional Lobachevsky spaces. It appears that even dimensional Lobachevsky spaces are very like to spheres from this point of view, but odd dimensional Lobachevsky spaces are quite different. Uh, okay, and maybe uh, at this point let's forget for uh, for a moment about the law of conjecture, and uh, I will speak uh, on some things uh, related. Uh, well, the main idea behind this, uh, one more, uh, several words about this, the strange fact is that the proof of this theorem uh, is completely different from the proof of, uh, of the that theorems. That theorems in Euclidean spaces are proved by induction on the, com on the combinatorial type of polyhedron. So the main idea is to simplify the combinatorial type of the polyhedron and to deduce this theorem from uh, uh, okay, from uh, uh, actually, oh, uh, I forget to say that actually in this situation the result is the following, that the volume of any, not necessarily uh, flexible polyhedron satisfies some polynomial monic polynomial relation uh, with coefficients dependent only on edge length. So this means that for given combinatorial type and given uh, edge length, my polyhedron uh, can have only finite number of uh, volumes, so it cannot vary uh, continuously. So this approach doesn't work in this situation. The volume is known to be not algebraic function, it's a uh, highly transcendental function. Uh, and uh, still, this proof is not by induction. Uh, it is by induction, but it is by induction on dimension rather than on complexity. Uh, we, we do not proceed by uh, complexity of the manifold. Okay, but uh, the main idea here is to study the analytic continuation of the volume of the polyhedron. And I start with the simplest case, uh, with the analytic continuation of the volume of a simplex. So consider an n-dimensional simplex in Lobachevsky space. Uh, its vertices can be enumerated from 0 to n. And the it is well known that natural parameters in this situation are hyperbolic cosines of edge length. Uh, and we can uh, so this, this was, uh, we, we can form such matrix, which is n plus one times n plus one matrix, and in the vector model for the Lobachevsky space, this is the gram matrix of its vertices. And these are natural parameters, and I can consider the function which computes volume of uh, of the simplex from this matrix. So this is the natural function. Uh, uh, and I would like to study its analytic continuation. Its analytic continuation was studied by Aomota in 1973. Uh, and uh, his result is as follows. Okay, what is the dimension of the set of such matrices? It's easy to see that it's the binomial coefficient n plus 1 over 2. Uh, so we have the following picture. We have, well, this line will be r n plus 1 over 2, where this matrix is this. But uh, uh, the gram matrix of the vertices of the simplex in Lobachevsky space cannot be arbitrary. So we have here some domain u which consists of gram matrices of synthesis. But, but here, not gram matrices. But, and we consider the complexification of this space, so we consider all complex matrices. And we, here on this domain, this function is well defined. And we start to uh, study its analytic continuation. 
And the result of our model is that this function can be analytically continued to a, uh, so V can be continued to a multi-value analytic function on okay on this space but uh, there is branching along some divisors so we should throw out the following divisors this DIFC is pr the principal minor corresponding to the subset so the branching is uh, a, a divisor where at least one of principal minors of this matrix vanish and uh, along all other uh, um, so it can be continued and it becomes multivalued so this was proved by our motor and what is the main lemma uh, which is behind this theory now I, I can formulate it is about this function and this lemma is quite different in even dimensional case and in odd dimensional case I can formulate them in both in, the, in both cases, but in one dimensional case it gives this theorem and in even dimensional case it gives nothing. Well, so the main lemma is as follows. But in even dimensional case it's easier. So uh, let me uh, define this multivalued analytic function. I will define it by V tilde. So to to, um, uh, to make difference between function and its analytic definition. So lemma. First, if n is even, then any branch of this function, of this multivalent function, is real on this view. Then any branch of D tilde is real on U. So, of course, the initial, the principal branch, which is volume, it is real. But we can go along some, uh, and uh, analytically continue along some path, and we uh, return to this U, and it again is to be real. So this is lemma. But, and what is in uh, the in odd case, on the odd dimensional case? For N odd, the situation is quite opposite. If we started from our initial uh, branch V and we continue and we obtain new branch V prime, then so for any V prime, which is branch of V tilde on U, we have two possibilities: <coughs> either V prime minus V or the prime plus V is purely imaginary on U. It's purely imaginary on U. So the difference or the sum uh, is always purely imaginary. O okay, this is a rather hard lemma. This is not straightforward at all. So this is the most uh, technical part of this proof. Uh, but uh, uh, for, uh, I have no time to describe why it is true, but uh, I will try to describe why this theorem follows from this level. Uh, okay. Uh, and, uh, well, well, and also before uh, I pass to the theorem, I want to say what is in the spherical case. In the spherical case, we uh, can do all the same, but instead of uh, hyperbolic cosine, it is natural to take usual cosines. Uh, and all the, the same, and in <coughs> spherical case, this lemma is all, 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 also true, but this lemma is all, uh, uh, always the first case. Uh, uh, 
is true. So uh, for an even and an odd, always the any branch of this function will be real. Okay, and now uh, I want uh, to show why the theorem follows from this lemma. Uh, so first of all, let us consider. Uh, hey, I forget to say very important thing that. Uh, uh, I always, uh, uh, there are two notions. We deform polyhedron preserving its edge length, and we deform polyhedron so that its faces are rigid. We want to deform polyhedron so that its faces are rigid, but we can always subdivide its faces and make our polyhedron simplicial. And then this is the same to, speak, to say that all edge lengths are constant and to say that all uh, faces are rigid. So further, I always work <laughs> with simplicial computer, we always subdivide into simplices, and uh, I can say that uh, its uh, edge lengths are constant, and uh, then, okay, its faces become rigid automatically. Okay, let us start with the usual uh, vector model for the Lobachevsky space. We take pseudo-Euclidean space and we take this hyperboloid <coughs> uh, where we have pseudo-Euclidean uh, scalar product uh, and uh, the Lobachevsky geometry is realized on this hyperboloid. Okay, and I would like to fix a combinatorial type, so I fix a simplicial complex, which is underlying my polyhedron, and I fix, uh, so combinatorial type, and I fix the set of edge lengths. I also would like to fix them, and I would like to consider the space of all polyhedra in Lobachevsky space with the prescribed <coughs> combinatorial type and edge lengths. What is it? Actually, it's a real affine variety, and I would like to show this. Okay, which are equations of them? For each vertex v, we should consider uh, it has n plus one coordinates, v zero, v n, in this Euclidean space. So, which equations do we have? We have equations. That all these vertices lie on the hyperboloid, and we have equations that if two vertices are joined by an edge, then the, we, we should have prescribed edge lengths. And this is the, such equations. Uv is hyperbolic cosine of the prescribed edge lengths. So uh, <coughs> if if uv is an edge. If uv is a diagonal, then no equation for this pair. So we have all these equations, and these equations, uh, um, these equations produce me a configuration space of all polyhedra with the prescribed edge lengths. I denoted sigma, and it lies in some big uh, 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 space R n. Uh, I'm cheating slightly because actually this is not uh, v belongs to the uh, this is v belongs to the hyperboloid but not to the proper sheet of a hyperboloid but this is not so important here uh, I, I don't want to stop okay so and then I can this is a fine real variety and I can consider Indeed, we should take a connected component of the fine real variety. And I can, can consider its complexification, which lies in Cn. And again, I have uh, the picture is like that. We have this sigma, and we have its complexification. And again, here, uh, here on this sigma, I have my volume function. This is volume function of my polyhedron. So let the be this initial polyhedron. Uh, 
Uh, and I would like to continue it analytically on this uh, complexification. And it appears that in this case, it can be done explicitly. Why? Because there is a, a wonderful Schlafless formula for the differential of the volume. This formula is as follows. Suppose that we have a polyhedron, which is in the Lobachevsky space, which is deformed, preserving its combinatorial type, not uh, necessarily preserving its edge length. So uh, in this uh, context, edge length can differ. But preserving its combinatorial type, <coughs> then the differential of the volume of this polyhedron is computed by the following formula. It's the sum over all faces of co-dimension 2. We should take n minus 1 dimensional volume of this face times the differential of the dihedral angles and angle of this space. So we have this formula. But now, this is general formula, but now let us use it in this situation. In this particular situation, when we are on this sigma, when our edge lengths are preserved, we also have that these volumes are constant, because these are volumes of faces. So we can integrate this equation. So we, have, we can write Vp equals minus 1 over m minus 1, sum over f, the f alpha f, plus some constant, more of some real constant. Uh, okay, uh, and and these uh, angles can be easily written down explicitly. It, it is just a uh, simple geometric task. Uh, and uh, what I need, I need that uh, actually the the expression for these angles has the following. Uh, it is i times logarithm of some polynomial in uh, in the coordinates in my coordinates of vertices in the coordinates of vertices this polynomial can be written explicitly but I, I, I do not need it uh, I need only this thing okay and now uh, this uh, th this function uh, I, I should substitute it here, and now I would like to uh, ask, okay, I started from here and I make some analytic continuation and I, I return to this point. What would happen with my function? Looking on this uh, thing, I can say, okay, each logarithm, the only thing which can happen to it, we can add 2 pi i times something some constant, uh, the time some n, okay? Uh, here we have one more i, so it becomes real. And here these are all real constants. So the only thing which, which can happen when we continue, we can only add a real constant. Okay, and now I, I can uh, complete the proof of the theorem because uh, now we can subdivide this polyhedron into simplices and look on each simplex separately. And that lemma, that main technical lemma, says us that if we analytically continue the volume of a simplex, then Okay, here difference of sum. Uh, let me look on the own difference. Uh, it can be made in this. That new uh, branch differs from the initial one on some uh, purely imaginary function. And here we have real constant. So uh, the the conclusion is that indeed my function Vp is single value on this uh, complex of fine variety is single value on this complex 
defined variety. So it, it's an elliptic continuation is not multivalued, but it's single valued. And now the, uh, it, it's very easy to conclude the proof of the theorem. The, mat the matter is that looking on this, here we have logarithm. So it, this function has only logarithmical growth on this affine variety. And it can be deduced from uh, standard Liouville's theorem on entire function that we cannot have on affine variety, we cannot have one uh, single value analytic functions of logarithmic growth. They are only constant. So uh, finally, we use Liouville's function, on, uh, Liouville's theorem on entire functions, and we obtain that this function is actually constant. Okay, I have four minutes, as, as far as I understand, uh, and uh, uh, oh, what can I do in these four minutes? Uh, maybe I will formulate the conjecture which I think is true in spheres, which may be true in spheres. Uh, okay, we see that this Delos conjecture is wrong in, in, this, uh, in, in spheres, but what can we... Uh, actually, the situation is as follows, that possibly it is not a right way to consider polyhedra in open hemisphere. The right way seems to be that the following. If we have a flexible polyhedron, if we have a flexible polyhedron in n-dimensional sphere, uh, then we always can do the following operation. We always can take any of its vertices, so it, it is contained in some faces and replace this vertex by the antipodal point. So delete this vertex, delete all edges and faces in, in which it, it is contained, and replace it with the opposite face. Okay, then these edge lengths are also constant, because if the distance from one point to another is constant, then the distance from this point to the antipod of that point is also constant. So from one uh, flexible polyhedron, we obtain many, many flexible polyhedra. We can change some of their vertices by the opposite. And some, uh, so, okay, from, from one flexible polyhedron, we obtain two to the power m flexible polyhedra, where m is the number of vertices. And this modified Gilles conjecture, which seems, uh, okay, for all examples which I know, it is true. Uh, uh, for that, for the quantum examples due to Alexander and to me, it is still true. Uh, that among these 2 to the power m uh, flexible polyhedra, uh, there exists a flexible polyhedra with constant volume. For all known examples, it is true. So, so it may have not non constant volume, but we can always um, change some of its vertices by the poles, and then its volume becomes constant. So that this is conjecture, which maybe is true. Okay, I, I think I should stop here. Ah. <laughs> I'm very sorry. Uh, I just forget to, to make one thing. The matter is that in the Euler Institute it is impossible to, not to say about this problem due to Euler, uh, which is related slightly to this, that Euler asked whether it is possible that the two-dimensional smooth surface is flexible in three-dimensional space. And it is still unknown. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Anybody have a question? In the examples that, that you know for this last problem, uh, kind of uh, how, how kind of is there some difference, like some criterion? Do you see maybe is this which 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 of those flips 
you, you need to make, like kind of, you need to be closer to, like, because say in your picture, right, your, your buttocks is now further away from, like kind of, uh, how, you have some reasons, right, to make big conjecture. Uh, the, the reason behind this conjecture is the following, that uh, all counterexamples are constructed in such a way that we take uh, a polyhedron with constant volume and then we uh, <laughs> change some of its vertices by all mm -hmm. uh, No, I, I, I don't know which of them should be. Does there exist some reason about the realization of the local conjecture of all this act for the manifold switch with a not constant curvature, for example, more general geometries? Uh, I don't know. For, for non constant curvature, I, I, I do not know any reason. No hope, yeah? To get something reasonable. No hope to get something reasonable, yes? Mm. I have no hope, but maybe <laughs> there is some hope. <laughs> okay, uh, let's finish our picture again.